Hey folks, I'm Mark Ryan. This is Super Review, and this is the C Audio Bravery. I want to say it was about six months ago, I forget the exact timing, but earlier I reviewed the C Audio Yume, which was the first earphone that I had heard from this company, and that proved that C Audio has its, I don't know, we would call it tuning chops. Like they did really well with the tonality on the Yume but I wasn't that enthusiastic about the technical performance. And now this is C Audio's newest IM, the Bravery, and it's different from the Yume in a number of ways. We'll talk about the tonal differences and how this thing is defined sonically. But I think also worth pointing out is a couple other big differences. So one, the price, this is more expensive than the Yume. The Yume was around 180 bucks. This is around 280 bucks, so more expensive. And then the other big difference is that the Yume is a hybrid IEM. Frankly, a, like a lot of IEMs, hybrids just kind of run in the show lately and the Bravery is not a hybrid. In fact, it's an all balanced armature set, which I'm gonna go ahead and say that's a little bit brave to do in 2021, is that what year it is? Uh, but yeah, I've spent the past couple of weeks living with the Bravery and comparing it to some other IEMs in its price range. Now, uh, just as kind of a spoiler for the future, what we're going to be talking about is I will compare the Bravery versus some other IMs like the Moondrop Blessing 2, the Prisma Audio Azul, and the Thea Audio Legacy 4, a couple of other IMs in this price range, around 300 bucks, that I quite like. But yeah, I've spent the past couple of weeks living with this IM, comparing it to those, and I'm ready to let you know now what I think. Um, like my other reviews, this is a live stream, so if you have any questions about the bravery, anything else we talk about today, please do leave it in the live chat. And at the end of the review, we're going to get through this, get through the details, get give you a score. But at the end of the review, we'll have a little back and forth conversation, and hopefully I can answer all of your open, burning desire questions about the bravery and anything else that's on your mind for now. So let's go ahead and dive into the table. Let me actually go ahead and turn off this light again. Why do I always forget that? But... We are taking a look here at the C Audio Bravery. And I'll just say up front, um, shout out to Hi-Fi Go for sending this in for review. Uh, there's a link in the description to Hi-Fi Go if you wanna check this thing out. They didn't actually send in the full package, so I don't know everything that came in in the original package here with the Bravery, but from what I can tell, this is pretty indicative of the cable, the tips, and this little carrying case, which might be indicative of why they didn't send me the full packaging. This. I, you guys are just kind of trying to embarrass me with this kind of stuff. But uh, otherwise, it's honestly a, a pretty nice little carry case. I tend to like this style. It's pocketable. It's hard shell. You know, I don't use these because I use my, my dumb plastic boxes. But if I was going to use a carry case, honestly, this is, this is a pretty good option. Apart from that, um, a thing maybe worth talking about is the, the, the tips that come with this. Now, again, I didn't get the full package, so... Um, I'm not able to show you everything, but I believe this comes with two different styles of tips. One set of memory foam tips, which is pretty typical, uh, but also these, which are uh, Asla Zelastec tips, which if you're not familiar with this, this brand or this specific model of ear tip, it's actually pretty unique. Um, and it's frankly one of the more expensive ear tips out there that you can buy around like 10 or $20 a pair. So it's cool that the, the Bravery comes with these Elastic tips. Um, there are some things that are worth describing about the Elastics though, because they might be, they're, they're pretty unique. Um, one, they look clear, that's not that special, but they do have a fairly wide nozzle on them, uh, which can usually let through some of the, uh, the air frequencies in the treble, which we'll talk a little bit about more later. But really the big difference here with the Elastex is the texture of the, the, the silicone that they use. And it's got this like, almost tacky quality to it, which makes these things very secure fitting. And that tends to be what the, the Zelastex tips will do for almost any IM, honestly. They'll, they'll give you like an extra bit of grip inside your ear because the texture of this ear tip is so, I wanna say tacky, like it's not sticky, but it's like if you rub them against each other, you'll see that it's, it's, it's kind of got a gripness to it. But a side effect of that, and, and one reason why I don't tend to use Elastec tips on a lot of my IEMs as much as I do enjoy the extra security that you get from the fit, is just that these also will pick up lint. Um, I don't know that, yeah, they look pretty clean here, but uh, if you you know happen to like put these things on a couch or something like that, and the, the couch is not a leather couch, it's just a kind of a normal textured couch, they'll, they'll pick up some lint and, and that's, shouldn't bother me, but it's one of those things that 
Um, I don't know, it keeps me from using these, but uh, honestly, they're actually a pretty good match here for the bravery. So I did listen with the Zelastek tips. Okay, that's enough of the preamble about the, the tips. Let's go ahead and talk about the, the package of the unit itself. We'll start by talking about this cable, uh, which honestly, it's got some nice stuff going for it, but ultimately, and you might've seen the spoiler in, in the thumbnail, I actually didn't use this cable um, while listening to it, at least for not for very long. Uh, it is a cloth covered, kind of a braided style. And I, I like this. It does have the downside of, you know, being a little bit microphonic, but for the most part, you can see that the behavior handling and stuff in this is actually really quite good, which is not always the case of these cloth covered Cable. So generally actually pretty happy with that. Um, I was fine living with the microphonics, but if you're really sensitive to that stuff, I could see this cable being a little bit annoying, uh, but it does have a nice tasteful chin cinch, um, or sorry, Y split with a mostly functional chin cinch. It does slide itself around a little bit, but for the most part, pretty happy with that. Um, the thing where this cable honestly disappointed me the most though, is actually up here. And let's see if we can kind of get this on camera and display it as well as possible. I just find that the this whole package feels a little a little bulky, and part of it's because of the relatively long protrusion that uh, this two pin cable has. It's like it's kind of designed to fit into a recessed recessed two pin connector, but you can see here in the bravery, the two pin connector is not recessed at all. So because of that, and this is not uncommon to have an unrecessed connector, but when you combine it with a relatively tall connector like this, like it just makes for a package that I find aesthetically, uh, aesthetically gangly, which maybe I'm being uh, overly sensitive and, and pointing out something that doesn't matter to anybody except myself, but that was the thing I thought about. And then the other thing that I wanted to point out with this cable at least um, is it does appear to have um, come apart a little bit. There's, you know, the, the housing or sort of like this, uh, the, the wrap that, that holds the curve in place fits into this little metal round bit, but it looks like it's come loose a little bit on my copy of it. So obviously um, that, I'm not saying that's gonna happen to all of them, but just worth calling out that I did experience that. And because of that, I ended up using uh, just this cable, which is a, a basic moon drop cable. But otherwise, like that doesn't affect the sound if you're concerned about that. I'm not concerned about that. Um, generally, I, I, I well, I, don't, I just don't think the cables change sound. So um, for me, it was really just all about the, the handling and the aesthetics, which um, were not my favorite with this cable. Okay, so that's, I think, enough out of the way um, with the build on the cable. Let's go ahead and talk about the earpieces themselves, which frankly, I think are pretty handsome on the outside, but uh, a couple things, I don't know, maybe let them down a little bit. Let's say one is just that they're relatively large and I'll show you how they fit in my ears in a little bit, but I do like the aesthetic on it. Like it's got a nice depth to it. The pattern is pretty attractive. Um, I think with the C audio, you may, like I had issues with the design just being kind of too dark. You don't have that issue here. It looks pretty nice. The, the shell shape in general, and that's a, a difficult collection of words to say well. The shell shape is not the most ergonomic, but um, it's also definitely not the worst. It's just a little bit, I don't know, a little bit bulky looking. So let me go ahead and do a little fit demonstration so I can show you what they look like inside my head and generally pretty happy with the fit, although worth calling out. And I guess I can show this again on the zoom in. The, the nozzles are actually a little bit on the long side. So I actually found myself having to go down to the very smallest ear tips available, uh, which are the, the, the super small Zelastek tips. But with that super small tip, I was able to get a relatively I shouldn't say relativity, it actually quite deep insertion um, and it's a nice secure fit and isolation honestly is above average. What's interesting about the Yume, or not the Yume, the Bravery, is that there are some visible venting on this thing, right? You can see a vent up there, but this honestly creates a really tight seal in my ear and I get the effect of this being an unvented IM in terms of like creating pressure inside the ear. Um, it's a thing that I am fairly comfortable with and familiar with. Uh, you can kind of relieve that pressure in the ear a lot. Let me actually do a quick demo. Um, if you've had this experience yourself, fitting an IM, uh, you push it in, maybe you, you get kind of like a, an air vacuum effect that's not super comfortable. Uh, what I tend to do is I just pull up my ear to break the seal and then drop my ear down around it. And that usually resolves, at least for me, any discomfort that I have 
as a side effect of that. Again, that was an effect that, that's a thing I don't normally have to do with a vented earphone. And balanced armature sets, an all balanced armature set, you can definitely do unvented designs. And this one behaves like an unvented design, but as you can see, well, it looks like a vented one. So I'm not sure what's going on there, but I thought that was worth calling out here as we talked about the physical stuff here on the bravery. But I think that's enough to do it with the, the physical stuff. Let's just go ahead and dive now into talking about the sound. And like I always do, I'll just start with a general description of the sound signature. And if you're interested in diving into the frequency response and looking at that more exactly, I do have this measured and graphed on squig.link. Uh, if you haven't visited that tool before, check it out. Um, I've actually got a link directly to the measurement of the bravery in the description down below. Um, but for the most part, when I do these reviews, I try to, as best as possible, describe this as I hear it and not necessarily as I measured it. So, not that that's necessarily different. So here with the bravery, the general sound signature, I think you could describe as kind of a warm, mild V-shape. Um, the, the warmth is gonna come from a couple things. So the, the upper mid-range does have a little bit of forwardness to it, but it's, it's not as forward as something like you know, uh, an etymotic standard um, vocal forwardness. I would say the upper mid range here is honestly a little bit on the relaxed side. Uh, and then you also get a fairly wide band bass boost that when I describe it as wide band, that just means that that bass boost, rather than being just isolated into the sub bass, it actually kind of extends out into the mid bass. And so you get this relatively um, full presentation there in the low end. And, and that combination of the full low end with the, the somewhat relaxed upper mid range just gives this, I, I think, a, a, that kind of relaxed warm sound. Now to cut through that warmth, um, cause that, you know, a warm sound like I'm describing there can sometimes sound a little bit thick and congested. And I honestly don't think that's at all the case here with the bravery. And I think a big part of that is because of the, the treble here, the, the treble on the bravery honestly is a little bit on the bright side, a little bit on the zingy side. It actually extends pretty well. Um, but it, it does, it does have the effect of cutting through the thickness in that mid range tuning. And I'm trying to tilt this so you get a little bit of light on there. And you can appreciate the aesthetic as I talk about it, but yeah, um, that, that, that treble gives it a little bit of, a little bit of brightness and a little bit of zing to it. Um, it's also, it, I think I mentioned this already, but the treble actually extends pretty well, uh, which is to say that you get some treble in the air frequencies, which you don't always get with a lot of IMs. Um, it is actually maybe a little bit overemphasized. It comes across a little bit in the shushy side, I would say. Um, but generally I think it does a pretty good job of cutting through, um, cutting through that, that thickness in the, and, and warmth in the low end. So what are the things that I like here about the sound on the bravery? Generally, I think the tonality here is actually pretty good. So I described it as kind of a mild warm V you multiple ways you could describe the sound signature. It's actually pretty similar to something like the tin hi-fi T2 plus. If you've heard that earphone as a reference point, um, this is a different presentation of a similar sound signature, but it's, it's pretty similar. So it's just got this kind of warm laid back sound, but still also fairly energetic and exciting without being like overly forward in the vocals or anything like that. Uh, and generally I think, I think it's pretty pleasant for a, a tonality that I would describe as like kind of V shapes tone. Um, the, the mid range isn't really sacrificed here, but, um, it is, I would say the focus is more on the bass and the treble. Um, I think, uh, uh, the bass, you know, I mentioned it being wide band boost boosted, which can have the effect sometimes if you've got the bass, you know, too much mid bass bleeding into the mid range, it can have this kind of smearing effect. And honestly, I don't think that the bass here on the Bravery has that problem at all. I think the bass is relatively well controlled um, and you get a nice punchiness to it. Uh, the treble, again, well extended, a nice sense of detail. And I think this is this is worth talking about. I think this is definitely related. I mentioned that the C-Audio Yume uh, had a really nice tonality to it, but was kind of boring in the technical department. Like it was honestly just not a very exciting earphone to listen to. This. The bravery, I think, is quite excellent in the, the in the, the the technical aspects, right? So, really strong imaging, really strong separation between sounds, and sort of the the distinction of instruments and their position in 3D space. Not necessarily like the widest sound staging thing out there, but um, it's it's like I'm not going to complain about the sound staging on an IM. Uh, and and again, I think I don't know. 
sound staging is a bit of a meme in general. But um, yeah, I think this is actually pretty pretty well, uh, pretty good with that that layering and separation. And because of that, I think it actually does really well with busy music tracks, especially. You know, if you've ever listened to something that's that's busy, something like Drab Majesty or the Cure's Disintegration album, where there's just a lot of sound thrown at you. I imagine this would also work well for, I know people ask me for like metal recommendations as if metal is all one thing, but let's assume metal is all one thing. And the thing that dis that distinguishes it is just, it's just a lot of sound. Um, I feel like a, a set like the Bravery actually can do pretty well with that. So that's what I like here about the Bravery. Let's talk now a little bit about things that maybe I don't love, not my favorite things about the Bravery. Um, honestly, that treble. So the treble it, that is here, it's nice that it is able to cut through um, the, the thickness in the low end and it gives it that zing. Like I appreciate the, the extended treble, but honestly, it is a little bit on, um, a little bit on the irritating side. And I honestly got better results once I started fitting this thing deeper, uh, which is when I switched to the smaller ear tips. That helped quite a bit, but it didn't completely resolve um, just just, just my issues with the treble, which is that it's a little bit on the zingy side, a little bit sharp. Um, it can add a little bit of a raspy note to vocals, which is just, you know, again, this is not a very vocal forward sound, um, but because the treble is still relatively, relative to the rest of the mid-range, elevated, uh, especially in sort of that presence region, it can have the effect of making vocals just sounding a little bit in your face um, with sort of that that breathiness uh, that, you know, it's not in all music, but if you're listening to vocals that are like that, and I do listen to a lot of stuff, like lately I've been listening to Men I Trust as always, but also an artist called Ghostly Kisses um, with some really nice vocal content, but comes across a little bit aggressive here um, on the bravery. And then I think also worth calling out is that, you know, this is an all balanced armature set, so you're probably not going to be surprised that I'm going to say this about the bass. Um, the bass here is okay. You know, it, it is a boosted bass. You get that mid bass bump. Uh, it gives it a nice kick, a nice punch to it. But honestly, like the sub bass, bass texture is, is pretty lacking here. Um, and I, I'm going to go ahead and attribute it to the balanced armature-ness of that bass, but you know, there you go. I can definitely hear that the bass is extending well into the lower frequencies, um, but certain things that, you know, have bass hits that give you that sort of physical sense um, don't quite have that here on uh, on the Bravery. So bass drums, they, they sound a little bit hollow, uh, and it does sort of give the sound here on uh, the Bravery you know, it, it is warm, but it almost gives it like this kind of thin uh, ethereal sound. It's not especially deep sounding, so not necessarily the strength here on the Bravery. But generally, I actually do quite enjoy listening to this IEM. But I thought it would be worth also pulling in some other IEMs that I also enjoy in this price range and just kind of give you a sense for where I think they land in different categories and some of this is gonna you know this is gonna be rank me ranking them in a bunch of different categories but just taking take this with a grain of salt this is my preferences in these categories um and honestly i think all of these sets are pretty good like i enjoy listening to each and every one of these but for different reasons so the the competitors here obviously the c audio bravery here we've got the thea audio legacy 5 here we've got the prisma audio azul and then here we've got the Moondrop Blessing 2, which is just kind of like my standard at 300-ish bucks. Um, but I guess also we're talking about the price here is not actually the same on all of these. This is $320. This is 400 Australian dollar dues, which I think is about 300 US dollars. This the Legacy 5 is around 250 bucks, and then the uh, the Bravery is 280 bucks. So kind of in the middle of the range here. So let's just talk now, first of all, and talk about the general tonality. And again, this is per my preferences. I'm going to go ahead and rank these like this. I'm going to say um, the, the Blessing 2, probably the Azul next, the Legacy, and then the Bravery. Um, again, I do enjoy listening to all these. So uh, just for context, when you see something land here at the end, that doesn't mean I'm, I'm hating on it, but this is how I would rank them in terms of ten tonality. Shouldn't be surprised. The Blessing 2 is essentially my tonal benchmark. Like this is what I want almost everything to sound like. So um, it's just really nice, clean mid-range, uh, a, a decent amount of treble um, a, a balance there. I do wish the treble was a little bit better extended here on the, on the Blessing 2, um, but then you just get really the perfect amounts of bass for my taste. 
which is roughly neutral bass. Here, I would say next up would be uh, the Prisma Audio Azul in terms of tonality. This is actually fairly similar in mid-range tuning to the Blessing, but you do get better extended treble here. Um, the, the, the sacrifice, I don't know if it's necessarily a sacrifice, but the trade-off versus the Blessing is that the bass, the bass content here um, is lighter. So we'll talk about the bass quality in a little bit late, a little bit later, but the, the bass content here is definitely lighter. And I prefer the, the balance of the lower mid range and bass here um, to the Azul, but definitely the Azul is, is, is definitely up there with um, my tonal preferences. Now, next up, I would say the Thea Audio Legacy 5, which is a bit of an, an, an oddball ball tuning actually, but it is still mid range focused and that's gonna be kind of a, a trend you'll see in my preferences. I tend to prefer mid-range tuned IMs. And I think that the, the mid-range tuning here, or the tuning here is definitely mid-range focused, but it is on the warmer side. Whereas the Blessing 2 and even the Azul to some extent are a little bit more vocal forward, the Legacy 5 is a little bit more relaxed in that sense. And then that will leave the Bravery um, here in fourth place, which again, not a bad spot to be in amongst this competition, but it's just, um, I don't know, it's a little bit sharp for me. And it's got that kind of wooliness in the, the the bass because of that mid bass and i find that the treble is a little bit overemphasized here so because of that um, and it's just mid-range is not its, its strength which again for me mid-range is is where i'm personally looking okay now let's go ahead and rank these in terms of bass bass quality and um i think i'm gonna do this i think i'm gonna trigger some people and I'm gonna leave the Moondrop Blessing too as, as my favorite in bass quality. Again, a lot of this is gonna come down to um, the, the tuning of the bass here is just about in line with my preferences. Like this is for me the right amount of bass. You get some mid bass body to it, um, it, it but you know, and then mostly you get a sub bass extension, which I think this actually does pretty well. And because it's a dynamic driver, you do get that sense of body and tactility that's missing in both of these um, all balanced armature sets. Next up, I would say the Legacy 5, which honestly is a little bit light on mid bass for my taste. The bass here is really focused in the sub bass, which is not usually a bad thing. Um, but I did find the bass here a little bit lacking. And, and part of that is more down to the um, just kind of what I expected of this, because this is kind of a warm tuned IM. I was looking for a little bit more bass quantity, but the bass quality here, I think, is actually uh, pretty solid. And especially if you're willing to get a little experimental and adds about 15 ohms of impedance to the cable, we'll talk about that some other time. Uh, the bass on this actually gets really quite satisfying, digs nice and deep, um, and I quite like it. Next up, I would say, is the Bravery. Um, again, it's all balanced armature. It does have a nice, a nice punch and a nice body to sort of the mid-bass character, but it lacks a bit of that physicality to it. Um, so yeah, decent base here for a balanced armature set. Uh, and then last, I will leave the Prisma Audio Azul, which also has uh, the challenge of being an all balanced armature set. So the base here, you don't get a ton of that physicality to it. And then on top of that, the, the base tuning here is just lighter than the base tuning here on the, um, on the Bravery. In fact, I would say that tonally, these things have some similarities above the base frequencies. But when it comes to the bass frequencies, you definitely get more emphasis here. And because of that, you do get a little bit more satisfying depth from that bass. Okay, now let's talk about treble, which is where this gets mixed up a little bit. And I'll actually say that I think the Azul moves to the top. That's where I think the, the treble performance is probably the strongest. Um, yeah, you just get really nice sense of detail. Uh, it's really well extended. You do get a little bit of tonal raspiness from the lower treble, I find. Um, but the, the upper treble that you have there, it gives it a bit of zingness to, but not to a fatiguing point to me. So generally I found the treble tuning on here um, uh, pretty well done. And then the quality of the treble really pretty, pretty stand out. Here on the, um, the Blessing, the, the tuning of the lower treble might actually be a little bit more in, in line with my, my preferences. Again, this is kind of my, my tonal preference but it does have a tendency to be a little bit sharp and sibilant in places where I don't have issues with the, with the Azul. So that's where the, the Blessing 2 lands, but also still quite into the treble. The Legacy 5, I would say, honestly, the treble is not necessarily the standout strength here on this set. It, of the bunch here might be kind of like the, the lowest resolution, the less detailed. Um, it's not It's not bad by any stretch of the imagination. In fact, it does extend actually pretty well without giving it too much of that, 
that characteristic zing that you do get on these two sets, which are which are pretty well extended. This one has a, a more tame treble extension to it, and and it's fine. Um, but then I do leave the the bravery last here. You do get a better sense of resolution and detail probably versus something like uh, the Legacy Five, and then you do get better extension than something like uh, the Moondrop Blessing Two. But I do find that um, here on the bravery, it's just where it starts to bleed into the uh, into the realm of being a little bit fatiguing and a little bit sharp. Um, sometimes it can honestly be pretty satisfying and a little bit ASMR-y um, here on the Bravery. And I don't know, maybe if you're into ASMR, that's actually a pretty a, a pretty nice quality here. But for most of my listening, you know, I, I found the treble there maybe because of that a little bit fatiguing. So I think that's going to do it for my thoughts here on the C Audio Bravery out of five stars. Honestly, I quite like this set. I find this, this is probably gonna be a set I go back to every once in a while from now on. Um, I give it four stars. You know, not necessarily my favorite set at 280 bucks, but I don't know, it, there's a pretty good argument for it, especially if you're looking for an all balanced armature set and maybe you're not willing to go the, the pure neutral uh, route with something like the Edemotic or the Prisma Audio Azul. The Sea Audio Bravia, not too shabby. So if you're interested in checking out this IEM, I do have a link in the description down below. Um, while you're down there, if you found this video helpful, please do hit the like button. Subscribe to the channel if you're not already. Ding the YouTube bell. And then I'll catch you on the next super review, unless you're here live, in which case, just hang around and uh, let's have a chat. All right, let me, as best as possible, catch up with live chat. Let me grab actually a sip of water. I've prepared. Oh, that's some good water. Okay, so H2O. Let me catch up with live chat as best as possible and hopefully uh, answer any burning questions that y'all have. I guess we'll start with the initial shout outs. I see a bunch of letters and numbers with a guitar. I'm just gonna, I'll shred with you, but I, I can't pronounce your name. Uh, Kim Simcoe, hello, how's it going? Nice to see you there. Scott Pledger, always good to see you. Uh, Darkness Deep, how you doing? First like, I appreciate you hitting that like button first. Um, no shame on the rest of the people that are here in live chat and they haven't hit the like button yet, but you can go ahead and do it now. It's okay that you weren't the first. It, it was it was darkness deep this time, but that's fine. Rob Hawk, how's it going? Hello. Uh, Shimon, what's up? Hello, God, good to see you there as well. Uh, Big Boss, always good to see you there. Demetrio Alvarez, how you doing, man? Scott Pledger asking, how much bravery do you need to listen to this I am? I think honestly, the the only bravery that you as an individual will need uh, for listening to this is, you know, you gotta make sure that you're you're brave enough for, for this nozzle length, which again, this doesn't even look especially long, long um, but I did find that it fit pretty deep. And part of that, part of that sensation might honestly be, be because of these ear tips. Um, because they're so grippy, you're just very aware of this thing being inside of your ear, more so than with mo most other ear tips. So that was why I definitely had issues getting this thing to fit deeply. But once I switched to the, the super small ear tips, um, didn't have that problem. So I guess not too much bravery. You should be fine. Martin Ferreira, evening fellas, evening, how's it going? Actually, what is it? Oh, it just crossed into evening here in California. It's 5.04 p.m. Shimon, you're saying it's 1.38 a.m. You are up pretty late. Um, I'm usually in bed by 10, 10, 15 ish. I'm usually asleep before 11. Usually I'll get in bed, mess around on the phone for a little bit, listen to some music and then fall asleep with IMs in my head. So you're driving home, looking for a 24 hour McDonald's. You're driving and, and watching me. Interesting. What's uh what's that experience like? I feel like uh, obligated to, to, to mess with you. Like, like, like scream out, like watch out or something like that. But, um, it'd be weird. So I won't do it. Not that that stopped me before. Where One Nation, how you doing? Saying looks promising. I reckon the bravery will have a spot in the sub three hundred dollar price bracket, and I agree. Yeah, I think. Look, we compared it here to a, a number of IEMs that, frankly, you know, it's 
less expensive than both of these, but I think if you're shopping at 280 bucks, you should definitely be considering your budget uh, up to this mat as well. And while my absolute favorite of these four is gonna still be the Moondrop Blessing 2, um, I also recognize that this tuning is fairly neutral and maybe a little bit boring for some folks. So for folks who are looking for a little bit more excitement in their sound and still kind of want that really clean, detailed, um, high resolution-ish presentation, I think the, the Bravery is actually not a bad option. Scott Pleasure, I'm glad you agree with me. You're saying the curls on the ear hoops are huge. I agree. And I don't know, it's weird because it's like the sort of thing that is, it feels subtle because if I hold it up, I hold up the, the ear hooks in direct comparison to something like this, it's like, okay, that doesn't really seem that extreme, but it's just, it's like a, it's a matter of proportions. And you know how like, you're looking at, you know, a face and maybe your own face, you're really familiar with your own face. If like, you just change one little thing about it, like you just take your own picture in Photoshop and you just squeeze your nose together or like move your eyes apart a pixel. That small change just kind of like changes. It doesn't mesh with your expectations of proportions. And I feel like, you know, as, as, as close as, you know, this ear hook, I don't know, is it really that much bigger than the ear hook here? No, but it's big enough that it, it, it starts to look a little bit funky and it's, a little bit exacerbated by the fact that this ear hook is a little loose. Uh, it's still functional, but it's just aesthetically, it's aesthetically off enough to warrant me swapping in this cable instead. Ah, uh, Recode asking, is it a good alternative to the Blessing 2? Hopefully I answered that question. Obviously it depends on what you're looking for. I, I could definitely see some people would prefer the Bravery to the Blessing 2. For my preferences, it's still going to be the Blessing 2. Um, if you're looking for, I mean, if you're saying as an alternative, like as like another neutral benchmark, I don't think the Bravery is that. Um, to me, to my ears, the Bravery comes across more V-shaped because of that mid-bass emphasis and that treble emphasis. I still think the Blessing 2 is more, much more mid-range focused. Um, but if you're, by alternative, you just mean around 300 bucks, what's a good sound? I think it's competitive, yeah. Rob Hawk asking for the C Audio Courage. You wanna see the C Audio Courage? I've got it, I've got it right here for you. That right there is Courage. Shout out to Tim Apple. I see some debate about whether or not two pins are uh, ideal. I, I don't have a strong preference of two pin versus MMCX, if I'm perfectly honest. I'm starting to prefer two pins, however, just because more of my IMs have two pins. And so when I get uh, an earphone that uses MMCX, it just means it's harder for me to find the right cable for it because I've got so many two pin cables and I've still got quite a few MMCX cables, but not quite the selection, in fact, all of these are two pin cables. Um, just as a, I guess a, an anecdotal, not quite data point, but kind of a data point. But Scott Pledger, you're saying uh, you agree with Brian Young. Uh, you've also come to realize that you hate MMCX too. We need better IM connectors. So there's hate for both MMCX and two pin, which I mean, they both have their strengths and I guess they both have their weaknesses. Um, I don't, I would say I don't hate either of them. I think two pins a little bit limited in my biggest beef with two pin is actually kind of uh, exaggerated here on the, the bravery. It's, I feel like it should just be standard to have two pin connectors be recessed. Uh, is this one an example of a recessed two pin? Nope. That's also not a recessed two pin. Is this one a recessed two pin? Yeah. All right. Shout out to Azul. Uh, the Prisma Audio for having a recess, recess connector. I feel like this should be standard because with a recess connector, you get something like, you know, this little extended bit can fit in there and it can fit in a little bit more securely. And it also protects against, you know, lateral pressure on this cable, directly applying pressure to the pins. It then, apply, you know, distributes that pressure to 
uh, this little recessed housing, which I feel like it's going to make it a little bit more, uh, a little bit more robust and resistant to damage. Now that said, I never actually damaged a, a, a two pin connector by bending it. So maybe I'm not, maybe I'm worried about something that's just a really unlikely thing. And I guess in my reality, in my experience, it's unlikely, but it's still a thing that I think about and worry about. And I wish I didn't have to. A big boss asking if my ear was covering up the vents, if perhaps that is why the, the, the bravery feels like it's sealing in my ear. And it's certainly possible. It's certainly a thing I considered. Um, but it, it's also the sort of thing that like, you can see where the vent is here. Um, so my ear, I don't think my ear would necess necessarily is coming out that far. In fact, let's go ahead and give it the fit test. I'll say this too. I did actually experiment with that and like trying to intentionally break the seal by pulling my ear out. Uh, but yeah, you can see that like, well, maybe my ear is actually touching that. That's funny. I'm looking at my reflection. Uh, but yeah, I did experiment with that, trying to like do things like pull my ear out of the way and seeing if that resolved my issues. And it didn't really. So I, I don't, I don't think that what I was describing is a side effect of my ear plugging the vent, but I'm also not the most thorough experimenter in that sense. Brandon saying good evening. Hey, good to see you there. Glad you could, glad you could join. Shimon with an interesting speculation that maybe they reminded themselves they don't have a dynamic driver in there. And though they even started the hole, they realized that they didn't need to finish the hole. I don't know. That would be funny, but probably not. I wish these things were a little bit, a little bit. I wish it was possible to take these things apart and, and play with them. Um, you basically, with this kind of design, you'd have to completely destroy the shell in order to do that. But I don't know. I'm just kind of a little bit more curious about how these things are built. Um, certainly afraid of breaking them, especially with a $280 earphone. Um, I don't know that I would experiment with there, but maybe I should buy some like $20 KZs just to take apart and learn a little bit more about the, the structure of these things. Uh, where one nation saying the tuning looks very reminiscent of the Anole VX. Yeah. And you can see that in the comparison on squig.link. I've got the Anole VX um, graft as well. So you can compare that. You could also, I would, as you're doing that, also compare it to something like the, uh, the 10 audio T2 plus, which I think is pretty similar. Um, I have spent some time listening to the Anole VX, but not a ton. So I can't make any comparisons there. Um, but tonally, it, when I was listening to the bravery, it did remind me of the T2 Plus. Ohm State asking, is it an imaging IM more than vocal centric? Um, I would say it's a fair uh, I'll say that's a fair description. I, you know, I mentioned that the, the treble on here is elevated and that does contribute to fairly strong imaging. Um, again, especially versus something like the C audio, you may, you just get a really nice sense of definition, uh, and, and, and positional differentiation between sounds here on the bravery. The vocal performance is not bad. Like this is not an extreme V shaped sound signature. The vocals are not like recessed or anything like that but they are a little bit relaxed. So I would not describe this as like a vocal forward set, um, not a vocal focus set, but it's also not really sacrificing them that much. Um, but yeah, I think to your question, that's a, that's a fair way to describe it. Big Boss saying Tanch Gym stuff has great imaging, but isn't necessarily mid-range focus. Yeah, that's true. If you're looking, if you're just looking for like a really solid imaging set, um, the Tanch Gym stuff, both the HANA and the HANA 2021, the Oxygen, even the Darling, uh, really pretty standout imaging. Um, yeah. Home State asking, anybody has the Lokahi? That's actually a, 
That would have been an interesting comparison if I had the Lokahi on hand. I have heard the Lokahi, the audio Lokahi specifically, um, but it's been, I don't know, about six months since I heard it, so I, I can't really make any comparisons for you. Both of the frequency responses are up on squig.link if you want to compare them that way. But I want to say from what I remember, the the treble on the Lokahi had a bit of a, a raw character to it, maybe a little bit less refined than the treble here on the Bravery, even though the treble was kind of like the, the sore point that I described here in the Bravery. Not a sore, sore point's a little bit of an extreme, but that's probably where it is the most challenging, the most um, the most likely to offend. Uh, the Lokahi, kind of similar in its treble emphasis, but also just had a little bit of an extra rawness or maybe a bit of extra grit to it. Um, but also pretty, pretty standout imaging there in the Lokahi as well. I think the bass on the Lokahi was probably better though. But again, this is based on a memory from six months ago. So take that with a grain of salt. Still catching up with chat. What's up, Precog? Good to see you there as well. Speaking of Lokahi, I, I heard Lokahi because Precog brought it over. I think he had it on loan from somebody else. Ohm State asking about the FIO FDX or the FD7. So the fo for the folks who may not be aware, um, I, I don't know, six months ago or so, reviewed the FIO FD5 there. Uh, sort of $300 single dynamic driver earphone. And then recently they've come out with two new single dynamic driver earphones. One, the FD3, which I unboxed a few days ago, not too long ago. Um, I've got that one in hand and I'm listening to it. And then they've also come out with the new FD7, which also comes out in an FDX variant that's kind of bizarrely gold and diamond encrusted, but you can go that way if you want. But anyway, that one's a more expensive one. That one's like six, 700 bucks, something like that. Also a single dynamic driver. I have not heard the FD7 yet. I'm not sure if I'm gonna get a chance to review that one, but I am, I am interested. Uh, Tim Baxter asking, what is the cable here in the Blessing 2? So this cable is from a brand called, I, I'm gonna call it Zin, Zin. Um, but if you wanna look them up on uh, AliExpress, it's X-I-N-H-S. Uh, they make a, a handful of different cables and I've tried a couple of different cables from them, like all of their cables. And this one was just kind of like, it's not the best behave. You can see it's a little bit stiff and maybe a little memory prone but it's so thick and luxurious that, uh, I don't know, it just feels a little bit extra. And I've got this cable on my Blessing 2, as well as my Moondrop S8, which they're my, like, they're my favorite I am. So it just makes them feel just a little bit extra. And uh, I appreciate that. R. Hoover saying, I have severe hearing loss and I need expanded and loud mids and highs. Any thoughts? So uh, it's really going to depend on which specific frequencies you have hearing loss in, because like a lot of hearing loss, like there's um, sort of like age related hearing loss where the general consensus is, or the general understanding at least, is that typically your hearing will start to go from the high frequencies and just start to progressively get lower and lower and lower over over time but there are other things that can cause hearing loss such as like i don't know maybe i ride a motorcycle for example right and a lot of people that ride motorcycles for years and years they'll end up with hearing loss because of the the, the loud sounds especially from wind wind people don't actually understand that wind is probably the biggest sound problem on a motorcycle but sort of that repeated high frequency sound from the wind can cause issues some people that play drums you know experience hearing loss because of and they'll, that, that hearing loss is going to happen in the very specific frequencies where that repeated loud sound is happening. At least that's how I understand it. I'm not a doctor. Don't listen to me. Um, but I guess that's just to, to say that, you know, hearing loss is different from everybody. So for you, you say you have um, a, a pretty severe hearing loss in the mids and the highs. 
let's assume it's relatively linear or it's like somewhat even and, and really you just want an earphone that has kind of like a, a counterclockwise bent to its frequency response. You might like something like, um, uh, I, you know, I'm thinking like Edemotic stuff. Like it's it's very forward in the upper mid range and, and go for not the XR. So just like Edemotic ER4 SR, ER2 SR, um, very light in the bass or even honestly consider something like uh, this, the, the Prisma Audio Azul, which I have removed from its cable uh, and robbed it of its visual glory. Let me go and fit this real quick. Uh, but the Azul here, right? Very light in the bass frequencies. It does have um, some upper mid-range forwardness to it. It is not the most forward upper mid-range, but because the, the bass is basically just linear and flat, it does have the effect of giving it this forwardness. And then there's actually really, really well extended upper treble, which depending on your hearing loss, you might actually still not be able to hear it. Like for, for me, my hearing goes up to about 17,000 Hertz. And like, even there, it's like, it's a bit of a, it's a bit charitable to call it hearing. Like I can tell that there is a sound, but I couldn't, I couldn't tell you what's making sound at 17,000 Hertz. But, um, the treble here on the, the, the Azul, it extends really well. So like up to like 15,000 Hertz, 16,000, like it's still extended very well. And, and, and it has elevation where almost everything else tends to roll off. The Blessing 2 is kind of an example. It rolls off there. I think even, um, even the, the, the Legacy 5, it, it has decent treble extension, but it doesn't hold a candle here to the Azul. The Bravery, I think might also be a pretty good balance for your hearing, again, depending on exactly what frequencies your hearing loss is is, is felt. But um, the, the bass emphasis here is significantly higher than it is here on the Azul, and that's gonna have the effect of somewhat somewhat masking that that boost in the treble that you get so if you're really just looking to maximize um that that treble boost and the effect that it will have on terms of compensating for your hearing loss i think something like the azul might actually be the the better route to go it's just um yeah you don't you're not gonna have to worry about the bass being sort of like the the volume limit right with uh, something like the bravery if you're cranking up the volume so that you can hear those high frequencies the bass is going to start becoming the thing that you your ears run into uh, before you get to the the upper mid range and treble so hopefully that helps anya avery with a unexpected dab but i'll give you i'll i'll dab back what's up Shimon saying, every one of these seems bad for my preferences, but the Blessing 2 is king, I guess. Yeah, I guess I haven't dived too deep into what exactly are your preferences. I know I know, I know, know you're a KZ stan, um, which we won't dive into too much right now, but yeah, I don't know. We should, maybe we should talk a little bit more about exactly what you, what you like. Jasper asking me uh, OH1S versus the file FH3, which one would I prefer? Um, it's gonna be a pretty easy answer for me. I prefer the FH3 and the Eco OH1S, assuming that S on the end of there is not pluralizing OH1, and is instead referring to the model of the OH1S. I didn't like that set very much. I did a review of it. If you wanna check it out, I would recommend um, checking out that review before you buy that set. Uh, Andrew, when am I going to review the 7 Hertz Timeless? I would not hold my breath for that one. I'm interested in checking it out, but I don't have any plans to at the moment. Hoth Rebel, what is the best DAP for downloading podcasts? I don't you I listen to a ton of podcasts. I'm a big pod. Like, I probably listen to more podcasts than I listen to music, honestly. But I don't use a DAP for it. I use, I just use my phone. Um, it's, it's really hard. With I guess given the volume of podcasts I listen to, and the fact that I just need a constant stream of new content, it would be really hard for me to manage that on a DAP. Another challenge is that um, most DAPs, their music interfaces are not optimized for long form audio. 
So if you want functions like being able to quickly rewind and skip ahead by like 15 second increments, that's functionality that's built into Android apps or just, sorry, podcast apps in general. And if you're using, you know, a DAP that just has skip buttons, that, that's not that functional um, to, to skip from the one podcast to the next uh, when you're, you're navigating like an hour, two hour, three hour long podcast. So, you know, if I were to use one of my DAPs for listening to podcasts, it would be one of the Android based ones. Check out something like the, the Sony Walkman NWA105. I think that's probably like the cheapest Walkman or sorry, the cheapest Android based DAP that I would recommend. And that should do a decent job. But you could also consider, I use also the Hibby R5S, which now that I think about it might, might be the better recommendation. It's a little bit more expensive than the Sony, um, but specifically for your use case podcasts, um, the, the Walkman's battery life when using third-party apps is, is, is pretty bad. The, the Hibby I find does better with third-party apps. And if you're using a third-party podcast app, I think that would be worth it. So check out something like the Hibby R5S. Brandon, what do I think of the Grado, or sorry, the, the KPH-30i Grado pad swap, the, the, the KPH-30i Ultra? So let me, um, let's, uh, let's do something real quick here. Let me pull on my keyboard so I can navigate my browser as best as possible. Um, I'm actually going to show you a secret. You want to see a, a secret on squig.link? All right, we're on squig.link. Again, this is where I put my frequency response graphs. If you're interested in checking out, here is the URL, squig.link. It's not complicated, but there's a secret here. You can go to forward slash HP, that's HP for headphones, .html. I've actually got some frequency responses that I've measured with headphones. Now, this is with a very different rig. This is with in-ear microphones. It's not as consistent as the, uh, the IEM measurements that I do, and because of that, like, use this tool with a grain of salt, but I did actually try. Um, obviously I've measured my cost KPH 30 I, and this is how it measures on my head. Uh, but I did also measure it with, uh, the Grado pad. So this is what the, the measurement of the KPH 30 I with the Grado bowl pads looks like. And I can pull up the graph here of, um, the original, original KPH 30 I, let me go ahead and change those colors real quick. But yeah, there you go. That is kind of the difference, right? So what I measured um, with the inner microphones and this matched my listening impressions because my initial listening impressions were that it just kind of kills the mid range a little bit, kills the vocal range specifically. Um, and it, it makes it more of a V-shaped sound signature. And that's actually exactly what we measure here. Um, so you can see the upper mid range of the, the, the bowls here in the blue line. I get a dip in that measurement. And that might give you like some folks register that as like a, a bigger sound stage. And, and maybe that's what you're looking for. But personally, I didn't actually like it. I didn't, I did not think that it made the KPH 30 I sound better, it sounded less balanced, maybe more fun in certain ways. Um, but I didn't, I didn't think that it sounded better. And, and, and for me, it was not worth sticking with. So there you go. Had a Mobius saying, not a big fan of the fable, the fable, the, the fabric cable trend. And I don't know, I'm of, I'm of two minds about it. Like, I think this cable feels nice and you can kind of see the thickness levels and like the, the, the layer, the laying behavior of this thing. I just shook my whole table here. What's going on, bro. Um, the, the behavior of this cable is actually pretty nice. And like, it feels nice. It kind of reminds me of the cable that came with what was that earbud that I reviewed? The um, the nice HCX EBX 21 or something like that? Like that, I like, I actually kind of like the way that this thing feels. Um, it does have the issue of being microphonic. So as this thing rubs up against my shirt, even with the over ear design, the over ear wearing that I that I did with this, I could still he hear some of that, uh, that shirt rubbing coming through the cable. Um, which is a bit of a downside, but for me, I don't know. It's mild enough that it was not a serious detractor. Honestly, if the ear hooks on this cable were just not as ugly, I'm being shallow, but if the ear hooks on this thing weren't as, as aesthetically problematic, I'd be perfectly happy with this cable, honestly. 
Like I think it's uh, it's it's very well behaved. You can see tidy in this in its roadie wrapness. So, yeah. Uh, and the incomprehensible series of letters uh, agreeing with me. I feel like a phone is best for podcasts. Totally agree. Uh, because you can use an app or a browser to down download them directly. Yeah, it's been a real... I don't know if I've really ever used a DAP for downloading a podcast. Like downloading an MP3 file and then dragging and dropping it over to a player. I mean, if you're really up for doing that, maybe something like this. This is the X-Duo X2S, I believe. Um, again, the interface is not going to be optimized for podcast listening, but at least it's a small, cheap player with a micro SD card and really easy to get files onto. Uh, Jasper saying, hello, I'm currently using the file FH3. If I upgrade to the Moondrop Blessing 2, would I find base lacking? Um, it's very possible. The, I would describe the FH3 as a somewhat bassy IM, especially the sub bass. It's got quite a bit of sub bass emphasis. Whereas the Blessing 2, I would describe the bass as, as neutral. Um, it's got a nice texture to it. Like I like the bass quantity here on the Blessing 2. It is what I look for. Uh, but I would not describe it as a bassy sounding earphone. If you wanted a bassy version of this, there is the Moondrop Blessing 2 Dusk. Uh, which adds uh, a fair amount of sub bass and I, and I find it does actually give it quite a bit more of that bass body. I think you'd actually be really satisfied with the Dusk, honestly. If you're satisfied with the bass on the FH3, the Dusk does seem to me to be more in line with that level of bass. But then you also get just the added benefit of the that, that mid-range resolution that you get with the Blessing too. So I would check out the Dusk. I think, I think you'd be pretty happy with that. Jonathan Lerner, sounds like you're learning. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to make a pun about your name, but you are listening to this while reading your lab manual so that you may one day be able to afford these IEMs. All right, yeah. Uh, Nutty Otter, I have not heard that eco wire. Uh, is that a cable or is that a like a Bluetooth connector? I'm not sure what that is. Uh, d -Chick, thanks for the, the super chat, asking a collab with Crin or otherwise uh, I unsubscribe. How do I, how do I interpret this? You're, are you threatening to unsubscribe if I collaborate with Crin, or you're threatening to unsubscribe if I don't collaborate with Crin? Yeah, I haven't gone down. I really haven't done any uh, uh, collaboration with other other I am reviewers or creators out there mostly just because I'm I'm a bit of a, a social nincompoop I'm not very good about reaching out and, and making contact be open to it but uh, I apologize if I'm I'm not very uh, proactive in that in that sense Jonathan asking, just curious, have I ever bought a Zeos recommended product? I mean, he recommends a lot of things, so I'm sure I've got some things. I think um, one of the one of the first headphones I bought in the hobby was the Philips Fidelio X2, and I actually do remember seeing his review as I was kind of making that, weighing that purchase decision way back then when it was really hard for me to imagine. I was like, I already have some headphones. Should do I really need to be buying another pair of headphones? like the Fidelio X2. His review was definitely one of the ones I remember seeing. Uh, Abel Santiago saying, I mentioned that soundstage is somewhat of a meme. As a newbie, I'm not sure what that means. So, um, how to how to best explain what I meant by that um, and maybe what people mean by soundstage in general. I'll, I'll just say for me, when I when I'm listening to music on a, a set that I like, like I do, I look for that sense of separation and layering. I want instruments to sound like they are distinct things within the sound field um, and not just kind of coming at me all in this like 
two-dimensional blob of sound. So for me, like I get the sensation of like a, a 3D sense or a depth to, to the music that I'm listening to. Some other people, when they talk about audio, um, and I don't want to say that they're like, I, I don't think this is at all a, a point of contention about being right or wrong. This is just kind of about personal perceptions and like how we interpret things and all that jazz. But the word soundstage, right? People describe uh, uh, either an IM or especially with headphones um, sounding like it's either closed in or like really big. Like the sound is really coming from outside your head. And like to some extent, I get that sense with some things, but it's not usually like a dominating characteristic of the sound for me. Like there, it's just very rare for me that I listen to an earphone or a headphone and that sort of positioning, whether it's this close or this close or this close, or like, it's very rare for me that that is a thing that stands out or is meaningful at all to me. So a lot of the times when people describe a headphone as having a really wide sound stage and then another headphone having a narrow sound stage, like the HD 600 is a comparison. And I listen to another headphone that supposedly has a really big sound stage. To me, it doesn't necessarily, like I, I don't hear what people are hearing. And then the way that that becomes a, a meme for me is that just a lot of people then get really focused on soundstage as this, um, as this sort of like ideal character of, uh, of an earphone or a headphone. People ask me like, what's the best soundstage I can get for this category of whatever. And like, in my mind, I'm just like, I, I don't, I don't really know how to answer that question. Cause to me, soundstage is just not a thing that I'm thinking about too much. Like I, I am definitely thinking about the imaging, like the, the sense of positioning and like, and maybe that's what people mean, but sort of like this 3d blowout, like this close to my head versus this far away from my head. Like that's, that to me just seems a bit of a, it's become a meme. Like it, it, it's a thing that people talk about, thing that people ask about. And for me, it just seems meaningless. So that's what I meant. The check asking any opinions about the Moondrop Kato. Have I looked at the craft? Do I think it'll be like, so um, the, the Moondrop Kato for folks who are not familiar with it, Moondrop, they had uh, the Kanos Pro, the KXXS, and then the Starfield, and the Aria, kind of all in this same long line of single dynamic driver earphones. The Kato is their newest one. It looks like it's a replacement to the KXXS. So like a, a sub $200 single dynamic driver earphone just got announced really recently. And I do believe I have one on the way for review. So I should be checking that out pretty soonish. Um, I don't want to say too much about like, I don't know how to interpret the graphs, honestly, that I have seen of it. Cause I have seen some frequency responses of it. And I think they come probably from Moondrop directly, but I don't, I don't really know how to interpret it because the, the graphs that I'm used to seeing are going to be graphs that either I make or graphs that some of the other reviewers that commonly graph things make, right? So critical graphs, I know what his graphs look like. Precog, I know what his graphs looks like. Bad guy, I know what his graphs look like. So when I see a new graph that comes from one of them, I have like a point of comparison. When I see a graph come from Moondrop, I am I know that they do produce other graphs, but I don't know that they have necessarily that, that same rigor and consistency that other reviewers, especially like Critical is really, really good about that, making sure that He's using the same methodology, the same, the same, the same uh, parameters when he measures an earphone today as he did a couple years ago. Well, maybe that's a bit of a stretch, but he's using the same methodology that he's used in the past. So that his his measurements are very comparable. I don't take that same. I don't make that same assumption about Moondrop's graphs. So I don't have any real thoughts about the the graphs that I've seen from them so far. Uh, Nutty Otter talking about, and I appreciate the, the honesty and the candid candidness here. You're saying you're 21 and you can't hear past 16 kilohertz. Honestly, I don't think that that's uncommon. I think there's just not a lot of audio content much past 16 or 15,000 hertz, right? Past 12,000 hertz, most IMs drop off anyway. There is, you can get a sense of air from, at least I find, from between like 12 to 15,000 hertz. Um, I, I, I hear it. I feel it. It does add something to the sound. Um, but I, there's not a lot of musical content past that. So 
I don't think you're missing out too much. Still catching up with chat. Sorry for the downtime. Orange Moon saying the best phone that I've heard recently is probably the Sony Xperia something. Makes me want to throw away my dap. Um, yeah, I you know, that kind of reminds me of uh, another bit of a meme. Uh, it, it, it's that, you know, people when they're shopping for daps and asking me for questions and recommendations about daps, there's a lot of focus on the sound quality of them. And again, for me, like just personally, that's not the reason that I have daps and that I use daps. I use daps all the time, but it's not necessarily because they sound better than a phone. Some phones sound really good, especially if you're using just like a, a simple USB-C to 3.5 millimeter dongle. It sounds as good as I need it to. I don't have any complaints about the sound. Uh, the real reason that I like using daps is you get a little bit more volume usually, but really the big reason is uh, uh, access to buttons, play, pause buttons, skip track. I like having physical buttons. Um, and so like even something like this, I would say probably sounds worse than um, a, a lot of modern phones, especially if you're using a USB-C dongle, this probably sounds worse than them, but it's got more power and it's got more buttons. So that makes it useful in a different way but not necessarily because of sound quality. And then Orange Moon with another take on the fabric cable, saying the fabric cable being likable, the Aria cable was memory prone and it was not usable. Yeah, the, the Aria cable is actually an interesting an interesting data point where I've seen a lot of people have issues with the Aria cable, not just because it's fabric and some people do and don't like um, fabric cables. That one was actually a little bit memory prone, but I think even worse, there's some issue with that cable and maybe this applies to other fabric cables, but the Aria cable, I've seen this a lot where it just like starts, the fabric starts to separate from the, the, the silicone cable underneath of it. And I think that probably has something to do with the way that people wind their cables. I would guess practicing the roadie wrap will save you some of that headache, but um, that is an interesting thing to note with that cable specifically. Uh, Connor Ferry asking, what did I mean by adding 15 ohms to the cable of the Legacy 5? And I'm glad you asked about that. Hold on one second. All right, so let's jump back over here to the table, move these things aside and focus here on the Legacy 5. So um, this is a pretty standard IAM cable, very low impedance rating, nothing nothing to, to worth talking about. But with a lot of earphones, um, if you increase the impedance of the cable, whether that's moving from this cable to a cable that has some impedance built into it, or by using something like this, which is uh, an impedance adapter, I can effectively turn this from like a sub one ohm impedance cable into a 15 ohm impedance cable. And that does not always affect the sound. Like it's what it's going to do is it's going to make your earphone quieter. That's going to be the, the, the obvious consistent effect. But with some earphones, depending on how they're built and how they're designed internally, and I don't know enough about how this stuff works, but with some earphones, you're going to change the frequency response of it. And sometimes it's for the worse. Don't get like, don't, don't get it in your head that putting 15 ohms of impedance on any earphone is going to make it sound better. Sometimes it will make them sound absolutely terrible. But here on the Legacy 5, I actually quite like the effect of that 15 ohms of impedance. In fact, I can jump back over into squig.link, um, pull up my measurement of the Legacy 5, and I can show you what it does. Oh, actually, it's um, not there, but here. All right, so Legacy 5, here's what the frequency response of the Legacy 5 looks like. Uh, I'm just going to hide that so you can see this comparison more explicitly. But here's the frequency response of the Legacy 5 standard. And when I add 15 ohms of impedance, this is what happens. Let me align it at five or at 500 hertz. 
Um, but yeah, you can see that by adding uh, that 15 ohms of impedance to the cable, effectively I get a pretty significant boost in the bass. And one of the issues that I found with the Legacy 5, again, uh, I'll, I'll say, I'll use the word issues, but just, I found it to be a little bit lean here, especially in the lower mid range. You can kind of see it in the mid bass, like the, it just, it dips down here, it gives it a nice clean sound. Um, but I wanted a little bit more, a little bit more body to that bass. Uh, especially for the the quality of the sub bass i wanted the mid bass to have kind of a commensurate body and it turns out adding 15 ohms of impedance actually gives it a really a really good effect there um, in fact you know there's different ways that you can align this to compare um, let's let's change it to 1000 hertz see how that changes our interpretation so there there you can see that um, maybe another way of looking at it is that it just it also creates a little bit more contrast with the upper mid range and just makes that that bass boost a little bit more traditional um, and carries through the lower mid range and then and gives it that mid bass body so in this this guys the the legacy 5 here with 15 ohm impedance i this is an earphone i've spent a lot of time listening to without the 15 ohms still a very nice sounding ear, earphone um, but not necessarily like i don't i don't go to it uh, in my free time, I, I suppose, but in my free time, I do go to it like this. So that's what I meant by that. Uh, Precog saying, once you hear speakers, you realize that soundstage and headphones and IMs is a meme. So yeah, I think the, the term soundstage kind of originates from speaker world, right? And speakers are a thing I'm not actually very well versed in. I did recently get a set of studio monitors to uh, complement my desktop setup. I'm pointing to them over here. You can't see them. So I'm starting to experiment a little bit with speakers, but it's also a little a little bit intimidating because so much of speakers is about setup and your room and like that's a lot of that's a lot of variables so but i guess what i was getting at was that uh, this this term about soundstage i think kind of originates from speakers and like if you spread your speakers out further apart you're going to create this this physically larger presentation to that sound um, and that is a large sound stage. Now, as you start putting headphones on your on your head or earphones in your ears, you start to change that sense of what sound stage means. And um, I don't want to say like again, I don't. There are times where I get the sense that this this set sounds big. Um, for example, like the AKG K1000. I listen to that headphone. That sounds like a very big uh, a sound stage, but. Most of the time, soundstage is just not a thing that stands out to me. Um, and I think whatever differences people are identifying, either I don't hear those differences or those differences are just like in contrast to the other differences of a headphone, just kind of meaningless to me. Gion Cruz, what's up, Gion? Good to see you. Any cheap Bluetooth earphones I can recommend? Um, it's actually been a while since I've been in the cheap Bluetooth game. My recommendation, honestly, at this point in, in the budget space, depending on how you define budget, but check out the Samsung Galaxy Buds Plus. I know they didn't start off as a budget earphone. I think they started off at like 150 bucks, but because Samsung has come out with a couple of different sets since the Buds Plus, you can very commonly get those things for under 100 bucks easy. And in fact, I see them renewed on Amazon all the time for about 50 bucks. And at 50 bucks, that's one of the better sounding, not just Bluetooth sets, but that's one of the better sounding earphones that I can really think of at 50 bucks. Like the, the Galaxy Buds Plus at 50 bucks, even, you know, even up to a hundred bucks, like that's, that's a good, that's a good buy in my opinion. So check that out. Hopefully I know the budget cheap Bluetooth stuff can encompass stuff, you know, as low as $20, um, even like the Halo G22. It's a couple years old at this point, so there's probably newer stuff, and I'm just not that caught up on it. The Halo G22, not a bad set for 20 bucks, uh, but if your budget can can encompass the the $50 renewed Galaxy Buds Plus, it's really hard to beat that. And Gian, hope you're doing well, man. 
Rinaldi, what's a good upgrade under 150 bucks? And that is, I'm going to say right now, too broad a question for me to answer, but not too broad for me to give you a recommendation. So I keep pimping the site, squig.link, check it out. Um, and in the, the header, there's this link to rankings, which is where I've got a list of all the earphones that I've measured and listened to. And I've got them sorted into different price buckets. I've got them along with my review ratings. I've got links to the frequency responses of them and then links also to my reviews where I have full reviews of them. So I recommend checking this tool out, right? And then go over here on the right. You've got the, you've got access to these filters and you can say, you said you wanted to spend, you know, under 150 bucks, filter it to 150 bucks. Maybe you're not interested in, um, two and one star IAMs. You only want to check out the stuff that I like and I would recommend. So filter it by that. And then, you know, if you want to get even more picky, maybe you're looking for something that is, is basey, a basey V-shaped sound signature. Click that. There you go. There's my recommendation for a basey V-shaped sound signature under 150 bucks. Uh, the TFZ number three, not necessarily my pick tonally, but if you're looking for a basey set, actually not a bad option. Um, but yeah, this tool I built so that Hopefully it can help answer questions like that because frankly, you, you don't have enough information in your question for me to really give you a good answer. Shenzai asking, what's up? What's up? How you doing? Is that a serious question? What's up? Um, not too much about the, the end of my day. I should shut this down. Start, start thinking about food. Now I'm thinking about food. Uh, Scott Pledger, um, with an interesting tidbit about impedance, you're saying um, when you have higher impedance, it helps take advantage of the damping factor, according to DMS. But I'm still waiting for his explanation on what that means. And I'm not going to be the person to, to really explain impedance to you. I'm really quite bad with electricity in general and understanding how it works. It seems like magic to me. I'll be honest, but let me... No, I'm not even going to attempt. Am I going to attempt to to explain my understanding of, of impedance? I don't think I am. Let me think about it. No, I'm not going to try. <laughs> it would be wrong. It would be wrong in terms of like probably misinformation. So um, I, I've heard something similar to what you what you mentioned there, that the impedance, like there's some sort of damping factor and like imagine an electric, electrical signal is part signal, part noise. And oh man, I'm trying to do it. All right, an electro signal is part signal, part noise. And um, the higher that you increase the signal, like the the, the noise might not, not might not increase at the same rate as the signal. So then you're kind of increasing the, the ratio of signal to noise. But um, now, now maybe the thing you're listening to is too loud or whatever. Um, so by increasing the impedance, you are effectively kind of cutting and filtering out that noise, which is coming in at a lower volume and allowing you to push the push the signal aspect of that electrical transfer um, more such that the ratio becomes higher. Now, take that with a big grain of salt. That was probably misinformation and YouTube's going to ban me for that one. But that's roughly how I understand it. Something like that. Don't write a book based on that. <laughs> L Rizzle saying, audio files sure are OCD on all this stuff, to each their own. I like quality sound, but much of this stuff seems obsessive. You're not wrong. <laughs> It is obsessive. I, um, subjectively, preferences, individuality, render much analysis void. To some extent, you're not wrong there. Um, th this is a very, very subjective uh, hobby, and that's actually part of why I'm, I'm into it. Like, I enjoy the exploration of it. I enjoy that I don't have to worry about... Um, I don't have to worry about finding the best thing out there on paper or I don't have to worry about someone else having found the best thing and me just being like, wow, I haven't bought the best thing yet because I I don't know if it's the best thing for me. Um, I do I do enjoy the, the, the search for it, but 
that does, I think, also play into the point that you mentioned, uh, uh, being fairly OCD um, and a little bit obsessive, for sure. It can get to that level. And I'm probably at that level, which I don't think is necessarily a bad thing. It just becomes, it, it, it goes from past the, 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 the point of, you know, I want a good headphone. And it goes to the point of, I now have a hobby, right? Which is, can be the same thing for a lot of different aspects of consumerism, right? Cars, right? A lot of people, I just want a good car, gets good gas mileage, has room for my stuff. Other people take that same pursuit. I want a good car that has a bunch of attributes and it then turns into a, a whole hobby. Um, and, and audiophilia, you know, in, in the same way that the car hobbyists are gonna be really particular about the damping factor on the suspension, the toe angle and, and the weight distribution in ways that a person that's buying a Prius just does not care about. Um, it's kind of how uh, a lot of us here in chat um, still hanging around talking about audio. It's kind of where we're at. I don't think it's a bad thing, but obsessive, I don't think that's a wrong description either. Shenzai, you agree that food sounds good, so maybe that's a good time for me to end this stream. Thank you all for tuning in. Thank you all for uh, 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 observing my review of the Sea Audio Bravery. Again, if you're interested in checking out this I Am, I do have a link in the description down below. And again, shout out to Hi-Fi Go for sending this in for review. I uh, really appreciate it. But um, while you're down there, please do hit the like button before you leave. Subscribe to the channel, ding the YouTube bell, and I'll catch you on the next Super Review. Have a good night. That's the wrong button. My buttons are broken. Have a good night. Uh.